Welcome, everybody, to the 17th annual Gene Sullivan and first annual Paul Red Sullivan Memorial Breakfast. I would like to now have the uh, Brockton Democratic City Committee Executive Board please come up and join me. And I'd like to welcome James Doherty, commander of the VFW Post 1046 here, to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Good morning, everybody. Could we all please stand, face the flag, please recite the Pledge of Allegiance. Hand salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Again, welcome everybody. I would like to uh, now introduce Deborah Garland, who is the chairperson of the Brockton Democratic City Committee. Good morning, Democrats. Good morning. morning. We welcome you to the 17th annual Gene Sullivan and first annual Paul Sullivan Memorial Breakfast. I believe Paul and Jean would be proud to see so many supportive Democrats here today. Because serving the Democratic Party was their calling together. Where Paul was, you would find Jean. They were a team. I remember fondly my last conversation just one short year ago with Paul. He asked me who I was working for. So I ask you the same question. Whose campaign are you working for? We as Democrats have the responsibility to care and protect the rights of working people. It's time to come together to unite as Democrats to move our party forward. I ask you all to join us as we unite in Brockton and support the, our slate of Democratic candidates with a coordinated campaign. Let's get Democrats elected on November 6th. The Brockton Democratic City Committee is grateful that you are all here today, especially for the presence of Congressman Stephen Lynch. Right. State Auditor Suzanne Bump. State Senator Michael Brady. State Representatives Jerry Cassidy, Claire Cronin, and Michelle Dubois. And our future First Lady of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, Cindy Gonzalez. Also here with us today are Plymouth County Register Deeds, John Buckley. Our Brockton City Council is well representative with President Dennis Ionieri, <laughs> Shirley Azak, Ian Beauregard, <laughs> Timothy Cruz, Jean Bradley Derencourt, <laughs> Jack Lally, <laughs> Thomas Monahan, <laughs> Attorney Susan Nicastro. Moses Rodriguez and Robert Sullivan. At this time, I would like to thank the Sullivan Breakfast Committee, especially John Drzinskis, Cheryl Lee Hopgood, Susan Hay Sue Hayes, and 
my friend and Ward 4 counselor and attorney, Susan Nicastro, whom is the hardest working secretary of the Democratic City Committee. <laughs> So it's now my pleasure to introduce Stephen Lynch, Congressman Stephen Lynch. He has been serving in Congress since 9-11-2001. That day is very important. He is a man of humble beginnings, being raised in house, public housing, the projects of South Boston, where he graduated from high school after graduation, he went on to work as, as an iron worker for Boston Local 7, where he became the youngest president in their history while attending Boston College Law School, receiving a degree while still being an advocate for working people. Stephen then went to earn to his master's degree in public administration from Harvard University while still in the Mass House of Representatives. While serving in Congress, Stephen, a member of the Oversight Committee, which makes visits to war zones in Afghanistan and visits with our troops. Congressman Lynch is responsible for ensuring the Commonwealth of Massachusetts receives funding for housing, schools, fire, police, and public safety. Just to name a few. Please help me to welcome Congressman Stephen Lynch back to Brockton. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I think your intro will be longer than my speech. Well, <laughs> a lot of folks here today. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. All right. It's all yours. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Deb, thank you very much. I think the introduction is going to be longer than my remarks, but, uh, but I appreciate it. You were laying it on thick, and I, I really appreciate it. Thank you. You know what? Uh, I can't come to this hall without remembering Red and Gene Sullivan. Uh, they usually sat, like, right there where the Sullivan family is sitting today, right? And, uh, and all, all their friends as well. But uh, they really were the epitome of, of uh, loyal, I would say, lunch bucket Democrats, the heart of our party. Uh, they, they were just, uh, they were a joy. Uh, they were supporters of mine. And uh, I think they were, they were a, a wonderful reflection of the city of Brockton. They really captured the spirit of, of Brockton. When you, when you came within their orbit, uh, of their family, you, be, you became uh, one of the members of their family. And uh, they volunteered thousands and thousands of hours on our behalf for no other reason than to, to make life better for future generations, for people who didn't have much, people who didn't have a voice, they would speak for all of us. Gene was sometimes eclipsed by, by, by Red, but, but not often. Uh, she was very outspoken, and they were in it together. They had a wonderful marriage and, and raised a wonderful family. But again, I think they, they provided an example, I think, for others to follow in terms of their political engagement, but also their, their tie to their community. And uh, I think it's a wonderful gesture that you, you continually name this and, and, and rededicate this this breakfast uh, in their memory, because it really, the Democratic Party really was and is their, was their mission during their time here on Earth. So uh, it's an interesting time in Washington right now. And I would say, I would say that the wind is at our back in terms of when I deal with my colleagues in Congress, uh, both Democrat and Republican, I can see the tremendous pressure that our Republican colleagues are under because of their unwillingness to hold uh, this president accountable. I serve on the Oversight Committee, as Deb mentioned. And 
the oversight committee has is the sole and 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 primary committee to hold the president accountable it is the longest standing committee which has subpoena power which can call uh, the the administration to account so if we take the house back in september excuse me november november uh, getting ahead of myself i will become the chair of the oversight committee subcommittee on national security which is in charge of So that, that subcommittee is responsible for investigating the president. And right now, all of those committees and subcommittees are, are run by Republicans. And they have refused, they have flatly refused uh, to, to investigate any of, the, any of the suspected wrongdoings of, of this administration. Uh, they've shuttled every single issue. So we are supposed to have public hearings so the American people can, if they choose, uh, watch those on, on, on C-SPAN uh, and, and, and see the way their government works. Transparency, that's what it's all about. Instead of doing that, what, what, the, what Trey Gowdy and the leadership on oversight has done is uh, deferred jurisdiction to the Intelligence Committee because they hold all their hearings in secret. So none of the details, none of the questioning, you know, when I, when I sit in on a deposition in the Intelligence Committee, it's a classified briefing, and I'm not allowed to speak to my constituents about that matter. Otherwise, I, I risk losing my, my top secret clearance. So they've shuttled all this information over into the Intelligence Committee. That will stop November 6th if we take over the House. So we have known for over two years that, that foreign powers, principally the Russians, but also Iran and, and North Korea, have, have tried to interfere with our democratic electoral process. We have, we have had one hearing, one hearing, one very brief hearing in the Oversight Committee after two years. That happened about maybe a month ago. I think they were so embarrassed that we were, we were going to have our own hearing, just, you know, on our own, without the authorization of, of, of congressional leadership. We've had one hearing. Our, our very democracy under attack. And the chairmen and chairwomen on the Republican side acted as henchmen, henchmen, on behalf of, of this president because they didn't want, they didn't want him to look bad because... He was refusing to acknowledge that our electoral process uh, had been interfered with. Even though 14 intelligence agencies of this country came back with the same evidence that the Russians had definitely hacked our elections. So part of our national security is obviously our electoral process. And uh, so we will, we will have a robust investigation of the, the integrity of our, our uh, electoral system, the protection and strengthening of our electoral system, so that this process where the people, the people get to debate and, and, and elect their elected officials without interference from foreign governments. You, you know, every, it seems like every election, when I, when I come here, I, I say this is an important election. But, but on this occasion, the very system the very system where we, we get to elect our leaders, that is, is under threat. And we have a president who just doesn't care about that. Doesn't care. About, he goes to Helsinki and embarrasses our, our intelligence agencies. And, and, and we have sons and daughters from Massachusetts and, and all around this country who are patriots that, that work for those agencies. We work on a regular basis to try to, you know, protect our citizens, protect our democracy. And he's embarrassing them in front of the world, siding with, with Putin and, 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 and that gang. Come on. We have higher expectations of our, our president. We have been poorly served. 
we have been poorly served. So the magic of democracy is we get to, we get to fix it. And, and, and those occasions are called elections. And we've got one coming up. Now, I'm a Democrat, so I know we can screw this up. <laughs> but we won't. We won't. We won't. The president's trying as hard as possible to make sure we take the House of Representatives back by, by, by tweeting incessantly and, 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 and not thinking before he, he speaks. So, so we've, we've got, you know, I, I guess a, a co-conspirator, I guess, in, in uh, his own demise. But, but we have to give a vision for us. I, I, I firmly believe that the American people realize now that they, they voted in anger last time and they, they made a mistake. And I, I think the American people will come back and, 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 and try to fix that. So that's why I say the wind is at our back. But we have to give a vision of America that, that people embrace as well. We, we can't just be against Trump. We have to be for something. And I, I think we made some mistakes in the last election. We can't make them again. You know? A lot of, a lot of workers in the Midwest and the South, were, were those, their, their jobs were devastated by NAFTA. I remember stand, when NAFTA was being debated uh, in the business circles, I remember standing uh, in, in a picket line outside the Sheridan Hotel with a bunch of other iron workers protesting against NAFTA. How, how did it come that, that, that Trump was the one to say to American workers in the Midwest and the South that I'll, I'll redo NAFTA, I'll tear it up and get your jobs back? That was our argument. That's our responsibility to get jobs back here in America. He took our argument. And why? Because we were talking about free-range chicken and, and things like that, that, that average workers on a regular day, that wasn't a priority for them. We, we drifted from our core message about protecting workers in this country, about equality and liberty. We gotta get back to that. You know, more than 50% of union workers voted for Trump. How does that happen? It's because they think we forgot them. Because the things we were talking about, we're not talking about to them. So we got to get our message right. We got we to firm up what our idea of America is. We got better ideas. We're fairer. We're not for tax cuts for the rich. We're for the American people. This should be easier for us than it has been. We just got to carry our message to the American people. So I know I'm, I'm literally preaching to the choir here, you know, uh, but um, and it all starts at the grassroots level. Uh, it all starts at just neighbor to neighbor, friend to friend. And, uh, you know, I know there's a lot on, the, on social media and but I, I think, uh, you know, I, I think that's another way we can get our message out. We can get our message out in a thoughtful way, I think. But uh, thank you for, for coming here today. Thank you for uh, your acknowledgement of my dear friends, uh, Red and Gene Sullivan. And uh, you know, really, Br Brockton is a shining example of what's best about America. It really is. And uh, absolutely. <laughs> Brockton is really, you know, when you think about the embodiment of what of what the Democratic Party stands for and, and the part of America, you know, uh, this president and, and the Republicans who stand with him and, and abet him and enable him <coughs> have, have disassembled, really, and are trying to disassemble the infrastructure by which, you know, families who are struggling achieve the American dream. They're disassembled by the tax code. They're, 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 they're shifting all that to help the rich. And, and regular working families are left out. They're doing it by the Supreme Court, by putting judges there that, 
that want to disassemble the rights that have been established for 50, 60, Abood versus Detroit. Come on, that's, as, as a labor law, law, lawyer, that, that's a, that's a 50-year-old case. And they're, they're, they're trying to overrule that. They have overruled it. So, so for the good of the country, for the good of the country, and, and for the sustenance and maintenance of the American dream as we know it and hope for it, we got to win. We got to win. We got to work hard. And again, you know, I, I, I know you're all out there. I know you're all out there. But uh, I want to thank my colleagues in government. I want to thank the Brockton delegation for, for your kindness to me. Thank you, Deb, for that, that very generous uh, uh, introduction. I guess it wasn't longer than my speech. <clears throat> but uh, let, me, let me just say this, this last thing, one last thought. It is an honor. It, it is. It is the highest honor that I have, I have ever received in my lifetime to represent Brockton in the United States Congress and, and, and to carry your message. And uh, every day I try to live up to your highest expectations. And uh, I'm thankful for your support and your, your kindness and your generosity. I'm, I'm thankful for your, your, your leadership at times uh, by sending me the message that I need to know what, it, what is best to do on your behalf. So God bless the city of Brockton, God bless our Democrats, and God bless these United States of America. Thank you. May I have Joan Madden and Eleanor Wentworth lead us in our grace, our blessing. Good morning, everyone. Could we, could we have a seat and we can bow our heads? Dear Lord, our Heavenly Father, before I get started, I'd like to take the time to thank you for this gathering, dear Lord. Thank you for the support that is being shown to us right now. And thank you for John Dzinski and Cheryl Lee for putting this program together. Thank you for Debbie Garland for having the chutzpah to call for uh, our Attorney General. And before we sit down and eat, dear Lord, I'd like to thank the people who prepare the meal. Amen. Amen. I, I forgot to thank the Sullivan family. Could you please stand, the Sullivan family? Could you stand? This is the Sullivan fam family. All right, folks, today's culinary extravaganzas. All right, before we begin, I just want to con congratulate the uh, Brockton Democratic City Committee and uh, thank you to everybody who is here. We have a ton of people here. And by White House math, that's one million people are here. <laughs> Believe me. But essentially, we're around 200, and that's darn good for Brockton. Yeah, all righty. So at this time, I would like to introduce Massachusetts State Auditor Suzanne Bump, the first woman elected to this position in the state. And she will introduce Maura Healy, the Attorney General of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Thank you. Hello. Good morning, Brockton. How are you all? Actually, I should be saying more than Brockton because I see that we have Easton here and Bridgewater here and East Bridgewater here and do we have Hanson in the house as well? Thank you all for coming together to support uh, one another uh, and to help raise the money and the energy to get Democrats elected this year. We're very fortunate in Massachusetts to have four women among the six constitutional offices. It really, it is a, a tremendous distinction. Four years ago, in the Democratic primary, you decided whether you were going to support a longtime party figure, a man who had run for office before and who was a quite honorable candidate for attorney general. You went with the new girl, though. 
girl who'd never run for office before, but had already been making, through her practice of law, a significant impact on the, on the lives of people, not just in here, but across the nation. You voted for a young woman of energy and of principle. You saw in her the commitment, the desire to be an activist on, be on, the, on behalf of all of us. And she has made good on every promise that she made. She's gone against corporations that pollute, corporations that cheat, corporations that deprive workers of their rights and of their benefits. And she's also taken on many times and won the guy in the White House. She's worked on all of these issues to protect consumers and to protect our civil rights and advance our progress as a society and as a nation. And she gets a lot of, of headline coverage for that. But she's also done something that I don't know how many of you are acquainted with. But she works all across the state on a day, practically day-to-day -day basis with young people because she is committed to helping young people and families overcome or avoid the epidemic of addiction. She brings hope, she brings education, she brings motivation to these young kids. It's work that she does day in and day out that she doesn't get a lot of credit for, but as someone whose family, uh, whose late husband, labored in the field of addiction recovery for many years. To me, that's the most important thing that she does on our behalf. I'd like to introduce you to you now, Attorney General Mara Healy. Well, good morning, Brockton, and thank, good morning. You know, is it okay if I pull this down a little, or is that gonna mess it up? Seriously? Oh, they don't trust me. All right, um, let me um, thank you. I'm, you know, I just vertically challenged. Thank you. Um, first of all, I just wanna thank Suzanne Bum. Um, talk about a, an amazing leader and a strong woman. Suzanne Bum is someone who is there doing the hard work. A lot of times out of sight, out of mind, in the, in the minds of too many, and it's critically, critically important work that she does to ensure integrity in our systems and to make sure that government is working for all of us. So, you know, I also will say this as a Democrat, um, Suzanne Mumb is always out there and at every event, and I really admire that. You're somebody that I looked to four years ago when I was running, and she doesn't get enough credit for always showing up and being in the right places, inside and outside of the office. So thanks so much, Suzanne. It's great to be with you here this morning. Great to... Um, it, and it's great to be with other uh, partners in government. I know you heard from uh, Congressman Lynch a little while ago doing really important work on behalf of, of all of us. And I'm delighted to be with my colleagues. Um, I, I know Representative Cassidy, Representative Dubois, uh, Representative and Chairwoman uh, Claire Cronin, leading a critically important committee in the State House, are here, Senator Mike Brady. Um, I had an opportunity to connect with so many members of Brockton's City Council and School Committee. Thank you for everything that you are doing. Um, we even have folks like John Buckley who made it all the way from Plymouth County. Thank you very much, uh, Register of Deeds. We appreciate what you do. Um, and, uh, and I really want to just commend all of you in government right now. It's not an easy job to be in government, to be on the front lines. But there's one thing that I've learned over the last four years, and that is the imperative that we have to work together, local, state, and national uh, folks who are in elected positions with our teams to try to improve life for our families and our communities. So thank you for being a partner to me and know that I will always be, and my office will always be, a partner to all of you. And um, 
And finally, I want to acknowledge uh, the folks whose names don't appear on the ballot, but are absolutely integral to ensuring that de Democrats up and down the ballot get elected. This is a terrific room to walk into this morning, you know, to see the numbers grow. Um, here uh, through the work of this committee is awesome. And to me, this is what democracy looks like, and this is why I am so optimistic about our future. It has been a really ugly couple of years now. I know that, you know that, right? Okay, but I will tell you, for me, the silver lining has been the number of folks, including somebody like Sue Hayes, who I just met today with her husband, you know, showed up after the election in November 2016 and started getting involved. The people who are coming out, who are, who are recognizing the stake they have in our democracy, who are helping organize in their communities, who are registering people to vote, who are knocking doors right now and making phone calls for the terrific slate of candidates on this ticket, that is what is so exciting. Think about the people who are running for office, okay? Um, although I was glad I didn't have a little competition this primary, so I don't mean to be talking out of both sides of my mouth. Competition's good though, right? People are running, people are on the ballot, people who've never run for office before, not just in Massachusetts, but all across this country. You know, I'm somebody who firmly believes that in this time it is important to remind ourselves that the Constitution begins not with the words, I the president, though he's confused about that. It begins with we the people. You know, we the people, and that's what this represents. So to Deb Garland, to all the folks on the executive board, the Brockton City Democratic Committee, uh, to all the wonderful and amazing ward chairs, it's nice to see Doris, you know, um, and reconnect after a bit. Um, you know, Ellen uh, Pesovich, amazing leader who I met, you know, years ago, still doing it and leading it and teaching other people now how to, how to get this done. Thank you for everything that you're doing. You know, Vernon, thank you for what you're doing. You're an example of somebody who's out there with a cause, with an issue, and you've made it your own. And I know it's personal. It's personal to me, too. Um, so I just want to thank you because it's the example of the kind of citizen, you know, resident leadership, people coming forward using whatever talents, skills, experiences that they've had, everybody's got something to bring to the table and putting it to good use in our time. So I want to uh, give a hand to all of you um, for everything that you do and, uh, and, and to say thank you. And you should clap for that because that's actually where the action is. You should clap for your Democratic City Committee, your ward chairs, your activists, your leaders, all your volunteers who are working here today. Just know that I am really honored to be here and be among you. You know, yesterday I spent the day in Lawrence, and I'll just, uh, I'll just offer a few thoughts. First, you know, I think about, uh, as we all do, the many victims of that uh, terrible uh, tragedy. Obviously, we need accountability, and there will be uh, uh, reckoning for that uh, through the appropriate state and, and federal uh, investigatory authorities. But for me right now and for the office, the focus has been on families. Um, I went up yesterday and my team got briefed by the public safety officials and the gas executives and I'm glad that power has been restored and people are now moving back into their homes. But um, a, a couple things I want to say. I think I want to say uh, first to all the first responders. I know Archie Gormley's in the room. You know, there are a lot of firefighters and police officers who showed up from all corners of the state to assist people and it's another showing of the remarkable work that those men and women do day in and day out. Also, um, you know, it was amazing to see, you know, I went down, I went over to, the, to one of the shelters and uh, it was in the public middle school there over on Arlington Street. And, you know, it was unbelievable to see all these Lawrence public school teachers and staff who were there working. The principal of that school had the whole place organized and, you know, down to cafeteria workers who had come in or, or back there, I saw them in the cafeteria in the kitchen, you know, figuring out how to feed 200 people. I think to me, you know, it was such a beautiful display of uh, the strength of community and all of the values that actually make not just our community and our state, but this country really great to see people come together. I applaud you all for making known some of the needs up there and, and providing a means to donate. Um, and make contributions, you know, um, I think that for me, this highlights some of the issues that we have in our gateway cities. And uh, I know everybody in this room knows and understands that uh, all too well. But I hope this is an opportunity for more people around the state 
to see the need because there are problems that existed there with education and infrastructure and a whole bunch of stuff that needed fixing long before this terrible explosion. And I hope that we use this as an opportunity to recognize the very real investments and support that we collectively need to meet, make in a state where there are a lot of people who have done very, very well over the last several years, and the economy in the state is booming in places, you know, um, unlike in other places across this country. But in some places, you know, that hasn't caught up. And, um, and to me, it was a reminder yesterday being there and seeing, um, and, and seeing firsthand the effects of intergenerational poverty and neglect and uh, abdication of responsibility generally by our collective commonwealth. You know, I'm not speaking to, to any one official or, or, or government. I, I, I'm speaking to our, our greater call for the collective good in this state and in this commonwealth. That's truly what it means to be a commonwealth. So um, I think things are going in the right direction. We'll continue to stay available to people. As you know, we put out in uh, multilingual uh, translations, information for homeowners, for renters, how to avoid home improvement scams, you know, how to make sure that those of you who are making charitable contributions know that it's getting to the right place and not some con artist. And we're going to continue to work with our partners on that. But I did want to acknowledge the people of Lawrence this morning. Um, and not just Lawrence, of course. We have North Andover and Andover and parts of Methuen similarly affected. Um, but here, I'm back in the city of champions, and I love Brockton. I was, you know, I grew up. So when I was growing up, I understood always that uh, Brockton High School and the Boxers, it was the biggest, baddest school east of the Mississippi. Yep. And, um, you know, uh, I thought I went to a big school in Hampton, New Hampshire. It was just 1,400 people. Like, whoa, Brockton was, you know, something else. So I just admire the resilience, the grit this, this city has always exuded, has always represented. And I really admire the strength of, of community. And I think that, you know, for me, it's particularly poignant this morning to be at a breakfast named in honor of Paul and Jean Sullivan. I had the opportunity to meet their daughter Paula and Vinny a little while ago. And uh, I just wanted to, to uh, say that I think that renaming this breakfast to honor them is so right on because, you know, it's, it's the, the, the kind of tribute that the Sullivan family deserves um, because of all that they've done for our Democratic Party and our values and ideals. And I know that these are values that are shared uh, beyond the Sullivan family um, and really reflect the great values of the people of Brockton. I think about the stories that I've heard about Paul taking his kids, and I guess some other kids too, he'd often drag other kids too with him, uh, to register to vote on their 18th birthday, right? That's cool, it's all about the franchise and there's no greater act than I think registering somebody to vote and giving them an opportunity to have a say. That's dedication, that's democratic value, um, with both a big and a little d. That's what it's all about. So, you know, I think about that and I think about the best way for all of us to honor them um, is by being here today and doing the work that I know you have been doing but that you're, you're going to continue to do for the next 50 days. Because these are challenging times for our democracy. We know that. You know, we've got a, a president who is immoral, um, who doesn't um, uh, understand his uh, his fundamental and solemn duty. We know that. We know that he is engaged in all sorts of illegal and unconstitutional actions. He has really cheapened uh, and, and broken down the dialogue and the political dialogue and the way the government is supposed to work. He's starving government too. Uh, he's doing all sorts of bad things. And right now we've got a Congress led by Republicans in both houses that is spineless and lacks the courage of conviction and compassion um, to do what needs doing. And you know, history will History will write about those folks one day and, and their um, failure to put country ahead of party in these times. So, you know, I, I, but, but I do think that the work is right now for all of us. And as I've seen, you know, the work is really the local and state. That, the local and state is where it's at right now. It's states and local governments that are leading the way and getting this country righted and back in, in the direction that it needs to go. And uh, that's what we need to do. Donald Trump will be our president for I don't know how much longer, um, but you know, our work has to go on 
um, at day in and day out, uh, regardless of what happens this fall and regardless of what happens in a few years. The work that this party needs to do, the work that we need to do together, needs to start with every election, school committee, city council, state rep, you name it. Every election matters. Everybody's got to get to the polls. That's the way we take this country back. You know, as Massachusetts Democrats, and I am so proud to be, to, to be one, we always fight for things that define us and stand up for what we believe in, even when it's not politically palatable, maybe when it's not what the majority of the public believes at any one time. It's important that we remember who we are and that we remember who we are in this state, too. I mean, I think about Massachusetts, the cradle of the revolution and our democracy. I think about the role of the abolitionists in this state and the suffragists in this state. I think about the fight for universal health care and marriage equality, right? We have a state and a history to be proud of, and we always got to go back to the well and draw on that. We believe that if you work for a living, you should be able to make a living. We believe that you shouldn't have to mortgage your future to get an education. We believe that healthcare is a right and not a privilege. That facts and science and knowledge will power our families, our economy, and our country. And that everyone is worthy of dignity and respect, no matter the color of their skin, how much money they make, where they worship, or who they love. That's what we stand for. That is what our democratic values demand. And that's what's at stake in this election. You know, right now, those values um, are not what we're seeing out of Washington or Congress. And we're not seeing enough of it here at home. We need to start with home. You know, when I played basketball, I knew it was about taking the court, not just sitting on the sidelines. It was about trying to make a play, not just trying to run out the clock and wait to see what happens and wait for others to step forward. And that's what I'm counting on all of us to do. You know, that's what I'm counting on the city committee to do and all of us to do in our capacities. We can't sit back and wait. We need to, to lead and now more than ever. And that's why I'm so proud to stand with the leaders who are on this democratic ticket and support them all from top to bottom. We're gonna make sure that Jay Gonzalez and Quentin Palfrey get in the corner office. We're gonna make sure that Elizabeth Warren gets sent back to Washington, D.C. with a strong mandate to keep doing what she's doing. And we're going to make sure that Democrats up and down the ballot get elected um, in this community and in this state to do the work that needs doing. Now, look, I have worked hard and tried to work hard the last four years with my team on a lot of issues. And, you know, I want you to know that the last four years have flown by for me. Um, but it's been incredible to, to see, you know, all that's come before the office and the work, uh, the work at hand, the work that's needed doing. And, you know, I'm, I'm proud of, uh, of some of our record. Um, we have a lot more work to do, I'll tell you that. But, you know, over the last four years, I did make commitment to addressing the opioid crisis a top priority because we have for far too long neglected real issues of substance use disorder and mental health in our communities. That's for sure. You know, and, and for me, that's meant working with the terrific leaders uh, of your delegation who passed really important legislation, uh, not once or twice, but multiple times over the last few years. Thank you very much for uh, all the work, particularly out of judiciary, to make sure we got that done um, and moving us forward to change prescribing practices and dispensing practices and the like. Um, uh, for me, that's also meant holding Big Pharma accountable, and not just Big Pharma, but the board members and the executives who laid the groundwork and created the conditions for this epidemic that has stolen lives and wreaked havoc with the communities all across the state and this country. I'm proud about working to protect students from predatory lenders and helping their families get relief. Last week, we had another big win against Betsy DeVos when she tried to strip away protections for student borrowers. We've taken her to court a bunch, and we're going to continue to take her to court to stand up for students and to stand up for U.S. taxpayers. I'm proud of our work around implementing and making sure that we were enforcing strong gun laws. Strong gun laws save lives. It's as simple as that. That's why Massachusetts has the lowest 
rate of gun deaths in the country. Now, I took a little heat for that, as some of you know, but I'm okay with that. Um, we've also been successful in, dis in defending the NRA's numerous attempts to sue me uh, in court, you know, and, and the courts have been very clear that we were right and they were wrong. You know, uh, respecting the Second Amendment and ensuring public health and public safety are not mutually exclusive prerogatives. So, you know, let's do everything we can to end, <clears throat> to end gun violence, to end gun violence in all, our, all its forms in all our communities. I'm proud of our record fighting for consumers. You know, last year we brought back a record $800 million for the state, you know, uh, and, and a lot of that work is done uh, out of the media and out of the headlines, but that's the work that's being done on our headlines when people call with insurance issues or issues about accessing health care, workers who've had their wages stolen, right? Seniors who are getting ripped off in scams, $800 million back in the pockets of taxpayers, back uh, in, in the general fund. That's the work of your Attorney General's office. And yes, it's been a busy couple of years. I stood at the Women's March with many of you and I said my message to Donald Trump was, we'll see you in court. <laughs> now, I didn't expect it to be so often or so soon. You know, but I'm really proud of the record and make no mistake about it, the lawsuits that I file, you know, the actions that we take are done in the interest of Massachusetts residents, our businesses, our economy, and our values. Suing to preserve DACA, right? For the sake of, of, of those kids who are out there going to school, serving in our military, paying taxes in the only country they've ever called home. Defending the ACA and coverage for women's access to contraception, right? Making sure that we were there to sue to stop the travel ban. Version 1.0, 2.0, you name it. We held that at bay for a long, long time. Making sure we held Scott Pruitt and the EPA accountable for wrong-headed, stupid decisions that not only are gonna ruin this planet, but ruin our economy and take us backwards. We've taken them to court and, and, and we're about to again on the clean power plan, I'll tell you that. But I'm proud of that record and I'll tell you why too. You know, first off, there is no planet B, we know that. You know, we gotta do everything we can to protect this planet. But here in Massachusetts, we have more clean energy jobs than total coal jobs in the entire country. So anytime the president wants to subsidize coal at the expense of our renewable portfolio, right? Solar, hydro, wind, we got great stuff going on in this state. That hurts Massachusetts jobs, it hurts our economy. You better believe it, we will see them in court, okay? And I could go on and on, you know, because we're going to be there uh, doing our job as the people's lawyer to make sure we're representing interests, okay? I wish I could say that the day was going to come soon where I'd wake up and didn't have to sue the president, <laughs> but I'm not holding my breath. So just know, you know, we're going to keep doing that and I'm going to continue to work with my colleagues around the country on that. But here's what's really important, okay? Here's where the action really is. It's at the ballot box. You know, and this is where all of us come in. Making sure that we're doing everything we can because people are counting on us. People that I meet every day behind the retail counters, the office workers, people who are taking care of our kids and our seniors, people who've watched the stock market soar while their paychecks didn't budge at all. People who still see every day prejudice and discrimination and barriers and obstacles in their lives. Young people who are finding out that college is way too expensive, dangerous drugs too cheap, and who are all sick and tired, these young people as I talk to them, of their math class being interrupted by active shooter drills. You know, I think about a mom I met recently. She's a nurse and her husband is a physical therapist and they're both working incredibly hard. They've got two kids in college already. They are doing everything right, but they can't find a way to figure out how to pay for college. She asked me a simple question. She said, what are we doing wrong? How is a parent to help? And I want her to know and everybody out there to know that their issues are our issues, our issues, the issues of the Democratic Party, the work of the Democratic Party. That's why you vote for Democrats. That's why you work hard for Democrats. That's why you're here today. Remember that it's Democrats who built the middle class who extended equality in health care to all, who explored the stars. And it's those same values that are driving a new generation 
to step forward and be heard. From Parkland to the Women's March to those willing to come forward and say, it happened to me too. Together, we're going to stand up for them. Together, we're going to do what needs doing. That means we're going to send Elizabeth Warren back to Congress. We're going to elect Jay and Quentin to the top here. And we're going to take back Congress this fall. And, and of course, in two years, we're going to fire Donald Trump. We'll make the calls. We'll knock on the doors. We'll fight like our lives and our future depend on it, because they do. We'll take care of one another. We'll take care of our community. In doing so, we'll take care of our country. I know that there are days, folks, where it is tiring. It is exhausting. I've remarked to some of you, don't watch the news. You don't have to watch the news, you know? You can get out and do something, garden, whatever. Just do something constructive, makes you feel good. But we pay attention to the news, of course. And, and, uh, and it is, and it is, um, it is disheartening, but you know, I just want to drive home today that the enthusiasm that I see in the room is what it's all about. The numbers that I see in this room are what it's all about. I think about a little girl I met recently in Fitchburg. You know, I was out doing these round tables to talk about substance use disorder and this program that I've got going in the middle schools on education. And you know, Fitchburg, as you know, is a community where uh, the vast majority of kids qualify for free lunch, and Fitchburg, you know, has, has, um, needs help. Um, so I was sitting with a group of about 10 students, high school students, who had been brought together. And the, the, soon it became clear there was a ringleader of this, of this group of students who were talking to me about what was happening in their classrooms and in their community. And uh, she, uh, at one point, she said something very courageous to me. She said, you know, I was born to drug addicted parents. I had fetal alcohol syndrome as an infant. I've struggled. I've worked. I've got a job, I drive my own car to school, and I'm on the student council and leading this wellness group at Fitchburg High School. And I learned a little bit later that she was the one who reached out to those Parkland students and invited them to Fitchburg, Massachusetts. And you may recall seeing in the news that there were some of the Parkland students who visited those students at Fitchburg High School. And on those days, when I question, do I have the energy? We're tired, right? I think about that girl. I think about everything that she has endured throughout her life, everything that she has overcome, and I think about her ability to find a way to make something happen. Because when those Parkland students came, they organized a walkout in Fitchburg, and they raised awareness about the issues of trauma-induced and trauma-informed violence in their community in all forms. She's going to go on and do great things. Those kids are going to benefit. That community is going to benefit from it. Don't wait for leadership on high. Transformational change always has come through the ordinary acts of ordinary people in our communities and in society. That's why it's about we the people. So think about that girl on any day when you're feeling low and think about everything you got and everything you've got to give. We can do great things, and I know we will do great things. Go get them. Let's go win. Let's go out and work our tails off the next 50 days. And we will change not only this state, but we will change our country in the process. Thank you for everything that each and every one of you do. It's an honor to be here this morning. Thank you very much again, uh, Suzanne Bump and Mara Healy. Very, very nice. Thank you very much. Um, now I would like to introduce Mr. Ollie Spears, who has some inspirational words. Thank you. Hello, how's everybody doing today? Is there any Democrats in the room? Is there any Democrats in the room? All right, all right. So what does Democrat mean to me? Well, I'm going to let you know. Give me a D. Come on, we could do better than that. Give me a D. D. What does D mean to me? Defending our democracy. Give me an E. e. Come on, you guys can do better. Come on, is, what, are you guys Republicans or Democrats? Give me an e. e. What does E mean to me? Equal rights and opportunity for all. Give me an M. M. What does M mean to me? Momentum, yeah. 
We have the momentum to take back the House and the Senate in November. And we need all of you. Give me an O. o. What does O mean to me? Ollie, of course, yes. <laughs> exactly, yeah, yes. Open arms to Lady Liberty for the future of immigrants to come. Well, let, me, let, me start, let me start over. Sorry about that. Hold on. Open arms from Lady Liberty for the future immigrants, for the future immigrants to have the same American dream as the past immigrants and the chance to have a better America. Give me a C. Yeah. What does C mean to us? Caring about every right, everyone's right, health and being and caring human beings. Give me an R. R. What does R mean to me? Relief of Puerto Rico. Resistance. Resist against racism, sexism, Trumpisms, and Government Baker's failed agenda. Give me an A. What does A mean to me? Acceptance. As American, as Democrats, we welcome all to the Democratic Party with open arms. Give me a T. What does T mean to me? This is the best one right here. <laughs> Trump. We are everything Trump isn't. Trump is everything Democrats aren't and are not. We believe in equal rights, equal liberties, and equal justice. That's what Democrat means to me. Make sure you vote on November 6th. It's let's Brock the vote. Let's go, Brockton. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ollie. That was great. Uh, it, all right, now I would like to call up uh, the Honorable Paul Stadinsky and Gerald E. Conifrey, uh the Scholarship Committee Chairperson, and award the Jean and Paul Sullivan Memorial Scholarship. Stadensky, sorry, Memorial Scholarship. So, the Jean and Paul Stadensky Scholarship was provided by the BDCC in memory of two strong Democrats. Both Paul and Jean were part of the Brockton City Democratic Committee and believed that a strong demo democracy started with an educated populace. And we have not just Paul here today, the Honorable Paul Stadensky, former Chief of Police for the City of Brockton, but we also have his sister, and his two brothers that are here, right? So would you all come up so Paul can introduce you? Okay. I don't know everyone's name, so I know Doug. Terry, Chick, and Doug. Um, so we uh, would like to call up uh, Brandon's family to receive the award. <laughs> so, Brandon, this is Paul Stadensky, and it's a, it, this is in memory of his mother and father that this scholarship is awarded every year. So Paul, okay. Yes, yeah. Good morning all. My dad and mom uh, are in a lot of memories here along with Paul and Jean Sullivan. Uh, we are lunch, lunch box Democrats. There's no doubt about it. And uh, I'm sure, sure that Brandon Ubizia, my pronounce right, is, uh, is an excellent candidate uh, he did very well with the, with the group that chose him, and uh, he was a gentleman. I met him this morning. He's a fine young man, and I wish him and his family all the best.
Um, I just want to mention Brandon is a freshman, entering freshman just recently at UMass Amherst, and uh, he went to Brockton High School. So we're all proud of him. I'd also just quickly like to thank uh, Jerry Conifree here. This uh, scholarship has a long and proud tradition, but just a couple months ago, there was in fact no functioning committee. And Jerry picked up the baton in June, recruited uh, um, a committee, myself and Jimmy Pereira and Joanne Zeigmet and uh, Mary Waldron, and Jerry's been very active in spreading the word, and we're hoping next year to have a lot more uh, applicants. And also, uh, we'd like to thank all of you that contributed directly or indirectly to the funds that we've gotten for this. Thank you. Now I'd like to introduce again Deb Garland, who's going to present the, Democrat, the Dedicated Democrat Award. Good morning, welcome again. <laughs> this is an award that was used to be given at one time, and we haven't done it in years. So when, in thinking about who this person was, it's a person that works tirelessly for every candidate that asks for the, their help. They work every week, every weekend, phone calls, walking, whatever you ask of her, this person, she does. So for her dedication and service on behalf of the Democratic Party in the city of Brockton and the Commonwealth of Mass, Doree Smith, please come up. <laughs> oh no, stay right here though, because I have two more. Thank you, and next, well, and next, this is given to, um, the. we would like to honor Paul Red Sullivan posthumous, posthumously for his dedication and service to the Brockton Democratic City Committee, if you'd like to accept. Thank you. I want you all. And lastly, I have a, a posthumous honor, I'm sorry, that word got me. Um, Denise O'Malley, Mark, Lindy is gonna accept for the family. Denise was a member of our Brockton Democratic City Committee in a very vital part. Thank you. Next up is uh, Mark Lindy with a tribute to Jean and Paul Red Sullivan. 41 years ago, I had the privilege of meeting Jean and Red Sullivan. I was 16, Paul was 42. There was a Democratic headquarters on Belmont Street right across the street from a bar where there's an empty space between two buildings. So we'd work the phones and the doors and the signs. And let me tell you something. I told him at one point that he taught me everything I knew. I told Paul this story again this morning. And he said, well, I must have not done a really good job. <laughs> and I said, well, that was the essence of red. Red 
if he didn't like you, he wouldn't razz you. He'd be very polite to you and smile at you. Now, Gene, on the other hand, they both loved everybody, but Gene was special. The, the picture we've had on the cover for years had Gene dancing on the beach. And Gene was such a pleasant person, and when Red got a little bit crusty, as she put it, she'd put him right back in his place. And that's what I remember about her. I cannot believe it's 17 years ago that we lost her. Um, the sparkle in her eye and the, and the white hair and just the look on her face when she was looking at her beloved husband. Family was everything to her. Family was everything to Red. Red and I were always on the same side when it came to November. Every once in a while, we weren't on the same side in September. And I can remember one story, and this is, um, whether it's politically correct or not, I'm going to say it, but um, Steve Grossman, who I supported the last time he ran for governor, I didn't support him the first time. And Red did. Red was with him all the way, and, 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 and Steve Grossman always tells me about Red. And, and, and Red said to me, I guess in his own inimitable way, why aren't you for your countrymen? He did. He did. Um, I said, well, I'm for the Irish guy. What's your excuse? <laughs> so the two of us just had a great time together, and he really, truly did teach me everything I knew. Um, he was part of that. That 1976 year, all the Democrats got elected. We got rid of most of them in Plymouth County. They were all Democrats. And Red was, you know, you heard everybody say Mr. Democrat. There was nobody I know. She was Mrs. Democrat. There's no question in my mind because she was the, the power behind the throne. Or actually, to be honest with you, he worshipped her. So I think she was truly the, the, the seated on the throne. And we miss both of them. And, and my last little tidbit is my dad hated politics. He passed last year. But he and Red were over at Bay Point together. And they used to eat breakfast together. And it was a very interesting conversation because my father would say that the only good politician is a dead politician. OK? And, my, and Red would say, well, there's a difference between politicians and public servants, people that chose to go into government to help people. And, and my father said, I, I, I guess you have a point there. The thing they did share in common is they were both Democrats, and they loved the Democratic Party. And it's a privilege and an honor just to thank Paul's family and everybody that knew Paul. Um, Brockton misses him. And when the coordinated campaign headquarters opens today, he's there in spirit. So I just want to thank you for allowing me to recognize the two of them. And I'm going to end. And I, I did want to thank you for the, the, the de dedicated Democrat for my good friend Denise O'Malley who was my vice chair for a while. I have an Irish blessing, OK? It's not the typical one. It, it more typifies uh, both of them. May love and laughter light your days and warm your heart and home. May good and faithful friends be yours wherever you may roam. May peace and plenty bless your world with joy that long endures. May all life's passing seasons bring the best to you and yours. Thank you. Except I guess I'm staying up here because I got to introduce the candidate people that are running for office. Um, we have a strong Democratic ticket. There's blue sheets on your table. You, you, you need to vote up and down that ballot. As a, a, a school committee person for Southeastern, which is the least recognized of the group, and Tony Branch, who's my colleague out here, we both represent the city of Brockton. And I'm remembering a good friend of mine today, Wayne McAllister, who we lost a couple of years, who represented the city for years. But we're going to start in, in order from the, the top down to the bottom. And they're all important offices. So let's start with um, my friend Cindy Gonzalez, who's representing Jay Gonzalez, who won our Democratic primary. <laughs> Come on up, Cindy. And I'm the timekeeper. They told me. Three minutes for everybody else, five minutes for you, because cause, cause Jay's running for governor. Thank you. Good to see you. Thanks. Yeah, do you mind? 
I'm also vertically challenged. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for having me today. Um, it's really an honor to, to be here. So um, thank you. And thank you to all of you who helped Jay win the primary. It, I, we've, we are so happy. I've said to a lot of folks, it's like this switch flipped the, the day of the primary. And there's so much energy and optimism. And we are feeling really, really good. So thank you. I'm getting signals that this should be higher. Yes. All right. How's that? All right. So um, I, a lot of you have had the opportunity to meet Jay. He spent some time out in Brockton um, as, as well as I did, I think, the caucus last year. So um, I won't go into you know his whole background and things like that. But what I will say is Jay is running for governor because he truly wants to make a difference in people's lives. He is in it um, because he is a public servant at heart. Uh, we have a president right now, as some of the, the other speakers uh, referenced, who is taking this country backwards every single day. And it is horrible to see what is happening to people across this country and right here in Massachusetts. And the only way that we are going to make progress on the challenges holding regular people back is with real leadership here at the state level. And we don't have that today in Charlie Baker. He is too often content to sit on the sidelines, let others take the lead. He's content with the status quo, and there's no sense of urgency in his agenda. In fact, I'm not even quite sure four years later what his agenda is. Um, yeah. So there is going to be a very clear choice in this election. Jay brings to this campaign and will bring to the governor's office a real sense of urgency to tackle the challenges that people are facing, whether that's our broken transportation system, our affordable housing crisis, public education, or as Maura referenced, the opioid crisis. She needs a partner in the governor's office who's going to show up every day and tackle this, this issue and others with a real sense of urgency. So. As I said, there's a very clear choice in this election between somebody who is there for the privileged and the powerful, who's not even trying to make a difference for real people, and someone who desperately wants to. And Jay will be that guy. Affordable housing looks different across this state. The affordable housing crisis looks different in Brockton than it does in Springfield or on the Cape. And Jay recognizes that and will work hard every single day to make sure that people can stay in their communities. Jay has a plan for public education that will make sure that no child in this state, no matter where they live, is left behind. Charlie Baker, <laughs> Charlie Baker's entire education plan has been to give a few more kids a few more seats in a few more charter schools. That is not good enough. <laughs> Jay will fight for, fight for and deliver a single-payer health care system that is cheaper, easier, and does a better job keeping people healthy. And Jay will be honest about what it is going to take to finally fix our broken transportation system. He has said from day one he is not afraid to invest the resources we need to actually fix our system once and for all, and he will get it done. There are a host of other issues that we need a real leader in this state to take on. But I think what's equally as important is that we have a governor here in Massachusetts who will stand up for people. We don't have that. Jay has been out with women at, uh, out with people at women's marches at marches for immigrants. He has stood with the unions, the gas workers who've been out of work for several months. It is important that people know that their governor stands for them. And when Jay is elected, he will continue to stand up and fight for people. So I just want to say we have 50 days, I think, um, left until this election. And we, like I said, feel confident that we can win this. But we need your help. And so I am asking you to knock a few more doors, make a few more phone calls, 
Jay likes to say, put a bumper sticker on your car. He likes to see them when he's out and about. Um, <laughs> Anything you can do, we need your help. We will win this election, and I know that you will all be proud of him when he becomes your governor. Thank you. And right after this breakfast is over, the coordinated campaign headquarters is opening, so you have that opportunity to get out and help Jay and everybody else on the ticket. We have, like I said, we have a strong ticket. We know it. Um, even the Boston Herald said that this is winnable for the governor's race. So we got to actually get to work and do that. We heard from Congressman Stephen Lynch. Um, I'm just looking at my uh, list here and see. I know Quentin isn't here, but he, he got a strong um, Quentin Palfrey, who's running for Lieutenant Governor. Uh, Jay Gonzalez and Quentin will make a great team up at the State House. Um, Secretary of State Bill Galvin is not here, but someone that has represented him and works with him every day. Um, John Buckley is. Luckily, John doesn't have an election. Bill Galvin actually does. He has an opponent. So I asked John if he could say a few words on behalf of Bill Galvin. Registered Deeds John Buckley. Thanks. Hello, everyone. Uh, Secretary Galvin is involved in a very contentious recount up in the 3rd Congressional District. In fact, Lowell was being recounted today. But if he were here, I know he'd want to thank you for the support that he got from Brockton. It was a two-to-one margin, which was very, very important. Uh, as Secretary Galvin talked about during the course of the primary, he's fighting for us in terms of security, fraud, domestic uh, violence abuse, and as Registrar Deeds, although it wasn't a hot topic in that race, he's been a very strong supporter of our technology at the registry. And last but not least, when the 2020 census is counted, and you know that President Trump is not on our side, you want somebody like Bill Galvin in your corner. So I ask you to help reelect him as Secretary of State. Thank you, everyone. And please make sure, even though John doesn't have anyone on the ballot against him, to check him off because we don't like those blanks. Those are not good. Forget about them. Um, I know we heard from our state auditor, who I think is gone, but she is a champion, as we know, for Massachusetts. And the, the women we have there, the elected officials we have, we're lucky to have. Um, state Senator Mike Brady is in the room. And he's a candidate for re-election, and uh, believe it or not, even someone like me who's pretty educated about candidates, I didn't think he had an opponent. He most certainly does. And Mike has been from the school committee to the city council to the state representative seat, and now our state senator, Mike Brady, has done a great job. Welcome, Mike. Thank you, Mark. First of all, I'm honored to be here to honor Paul and Jean Sullivan. If it wasn't for them, a lot of us elected officials wouldn't be here. And when I was a young lad, coming up to the VFW with my brother, meeting Paul up here, I used to take karate lessons, of course. I gotta get back in shape and maybe do a few more karate lessons, but I met him way back, and Paul and Jean were some of my earliest and biggest supporters. I'm forever grateful to them, and the Stanensky family as well. And congratulations to Brandon, because that's what it's all about, and those are the people that make us champions in the city of Brockton. I want to thank our teachers, because our educators are some of the most recognized people in the Commonwealth, and if it wasn't for them educating our students, we wouldn't be the city of champions. I want to thank our nurses, and we've got to support the nurses. <clears throat> I got hit by a car in 1972, and the nurses were the first, and they're the first responders at your bedside. So we have to support the nurses. And I do have an opponent. Allegedly, a lot of people didn't realize I had an opponent. And I'm not disgruntling my opponent. He's a nice young man. But we, be, by the way, we have to be leery of the Mass Fiscal Alliance 
and the misleading information that they mail out against all our Democratic candidates because it's false information. And I need your support. Some of our friends voted in the primary. They said, oh, Mike, you're all set. I didn't even put a vote for you. I thought you were all set. Well, we can't take anything for granted. I won a primary election several years ago to become your state representative by 14 votes. And if you think your vote doesn't count, and another gentleman on the school committee, a well-known na name, Hancock, which is famous with our country, lost the school committee race by three votes. So every vote counts, and I need you to support the Democratic ticket from the top down to the bottom. I want to thank you for all your continued support. And don't be fooled, there's a lot of misinformation about we've forgotten about the working people. The Democrats have fought for fair wages for our workers, for fair hours of work, for benefits, and all of the above. And we are giving a hand up, not a hand out. So don't be fooled by the misinformation that's gone out there by the misleading information by our opponents. We are for the working class in improving education, improving working conditions for our workers, and getting a better life for all of us. So I'm going to be brief. I want to thank you for your support. You know where I stand. I've been here for you. But without your support, I wouldn't be here as your state senator. And I want to thank my delegation in the state house, too, because we work together as a great team, Representative Claire Cronin, Representative Jerry Cassie, and Representative Michelle Dubois. Please, I'm asking for your vote, and I don't take anything for granted. God bless you. Thank you, Michael. Um, I went down and skipped a person. Um, we know our state treasurer is not here, but Matt McDonough, who's a good friend of mine, and there is civility in politics. I'm good friends with Claire Cronin, who I ran against, and she won, and with Matt McDonough. We're going to take the show on the road and tell them how you can be civil in Massachusetts. Let's hug it out, Mark. Oh, okay. <laughs> there you go. Thank you, Mark. It's a pleasure to be here this morning. Unfortunately, Treasurer Goldberg had an event in Acton, although she was down in Lakeville in her opponent's backyard with 50 volunteers and lawn signs uh, waving to everybody who was going about their morning business. So I can tell you, I, I wish we could keep Tre Treasurer Goldberg in Plymouth County every single day, but she is working hard across the state to earn votes to get reelected as your state treasurer. I just want to tell you briefly why I'm with Deb Goldberg. Uh, before I became Register of Probate, and I, I want to say thank you to all of you for that privilege to serve you, I was a selectman, and she called me as a selectman and said, I'm going to run for treasurer. I want your support. We had a half hour conversation ranging on all kinds of different issues. She knew what I cared about because she had been a selectman. She understood contracts for police and fire. She understood DPW issues and filling potholes. She understood how valuable lottery money is to our local governments, especially here in the city of Brockton. So she won me over that day, and she made a number of promises on the campaign trail that year. She promised that she was going to focus on financial literacy. She was going to make sure that young people as young as kindergarten could start college funds, because that's where we are today. You really have to start early. I'm the father of four kids, I, I can tell you personally. And uh, she's been there on the prim board, making sure that the investments on our public pension funds are made in companies that are working towards wage equality and making sure they have diverse members on their boards of directors. Those are promises kept by Deb Goldberg over the last four years. And with your support in the city of Brockton, and I can tell you as a Plymouth County elected official, you make sure that our Democrats shine. You make sure that we win in November. You can be there for Deb. You can be there for all these candidates. I can't wait to work with you over the next seven weeks. I'm very proud to be Deb's uh, coordinator for Plymouth County. If you ever have any questions for me, please feel free to reach out to me. And one personal plug is register of probate. If any of you have family members who are going through difficulties within the probate family court, whether it's dealing with divorce, the loss of a loved one, uh, going through estates, guardianship issues, uh, we especially deal with a lot of families who are struggling with the opioid epidemic, please feel free to give me a call down at the Brockton office or the Plymouth Courthouse, and I'll be there to help your families. Thank you so much, and have a great day. And thank you, Mark. We are in Ward 6, correct? Ward 6. It's the home of our state representative who represents Ward 6, represented Ward 6 in the city council, and needs no introduction, champion on behalf of her constituents. Thank Michelle. You. Do you think you can help me put this down? Sure. Yep. Thank you. 
I think it might be a last but not least scenario here, everybody. Um, welcome to Ward 6, and, and you're really in the heart of the 10th Plymouth District, a district I'm so honored and privileged to represent. Ward 6 is special. I was a city councilor here for 10 years, and I tell people how easy it was to be a city councilor for Ward 6 because there are so many single family homes and hardworking people that want the same thing that all of us want, uh, safe neighborhoods, affordable homes. They buy their homes so they can have a backyard. I remember my mom did. And I'm really happy to welcome you here to my district and to let you know we have a race in the 10th Plymouth District, and we can't take anything for granted. The Republicans are at it again, and they put someone on the ballot uh, that's from West Bridgewater, a Trump Republican, and the issue is going to be turnout. So I'm hoping that you'll help me turn out the vote on November 6th. Yes, yeah, it's really important. It's really important. Up and down the ballot, it's going to be critical. And today we're in a room I feel very comfortable in, the VFW. I've represented it for 10 years as a city councilor. I care about veterans. My uncle died in Korea. My mother's always been a member of the auxiliary and marched in every parade in respect to her uncle. And she taught me very well the need to respect veterans in their service to our nation. So I, I want everybody to thank you all for being here. And so when I was a city, when I was a state representative, I started noticing on the committee a lot of civil service exemptions coming through my committee that I felt very uncomfortable voting for, which would exempt communities from civil service with veterans preference laws. So I reached out to many veterans groups. I reached out to Archie Gormley, who was the president of the, Vet uh, the Firefighters Union, and he coordinated a meeting in this very room that had statewide veteran agencies and unions, and we talked about this issue and what came out of that because you know you give a problem to a veteran and they come up with the solution and their solution was what they call mass veterans edge they made everybody know they put it on the line to speaker DeLeo, every single member of the house every single member of the senate that we are not going to get rid of veterans preference with civil service and we're responding in order sometimes you have to be told what's going on before you realize that there is a plot afoot to get rid of veterans preference so that's just some of you know me from when I tried to stop, the, and we were successful stopping the trash transfer station that they wanted to put on the north side of Brockton. They wanted to bring garbage from rich communities, truck it all the way in for bring more asthma and pollution, put it on rails and send it out to some other poverty community in Ohio. And we said, no way. No, you're not doing it here. We're just as valuable as every other human being. And like everyone has said today, the Democratic Party is the party of working families. The, the people that wealthy corporation and interests forget or trample on. And those are the people I'm really the proudest to represent. So when I got to the State House, I filed what they call the Environmental Justice Act. And it more or less says, you can't dump on us just because we might not be rich communities, because we might not be a majority white community, because we might not have a great educational attainment level, because we rent. You can't dump your garbage on us. And I'm so honored to be able to say that at the State House. And you, what you don't, we didn't pass that bill this session, but the statewide support has gone far beyond me. All across the nation, all across the state, we have support for this environmental justice bill. And that's because I tell them, in Brockton, I don't have to explain to people what environmental justice is because it's this red or blue inhaler that you or your loved ones have to carry around. We have the fifth highest asthma hospitalization rate for children in the state every year. We need to stand up and say, hey, we're not your dumping ground. And that's what I'm honored to do next session when I refile that Environmental Justice Act. And I have my priorities straight, regardless of what the dark money Republican group mails into your home. I want you to know, I graduated from Brockton Public Schools in 1991 when funding was in the gutter. I saw my own student classmates who had so much wonderful poten potential drop out of school, go the bad way, 
because they didn't get the services that are offered in other communities that would have given them the opportunity to fulfill their full potential. And I'm seeing it again today with the funding that's going on in this state. And I want you to know at home and everyone in this room that your delegation delivered because Brockton was facing hundreds of layoffs because of the faulty funding system. And at the one yard line, at the very end of the budget process, through the hard effort of Senator Brady, Representative Cronin, and Representative Cassidy, we delivered the $2 million that closed that budget gap that was allowed the state, the city to hire back the people that were getting laid off. Right. And during my time on the city council, I looked at the numbers. There were a few years where the funding decrease were very similar. But us members of the city council said, uh-uh, we're going to allocate more money to schools. We're going to take the hit in different areas because our kids matter. And if you send me back to the state house, I'm going to continue that effort for all of us. So I have canvases going. I'm a, I'm a grassroots kind of representative from hometown gal here and so I don't win unless people see me because those six flyers that thirty thousand dollars that the dark money group sent out with lies and character assassinations against me some people believed it they thought it was accurate because it came in the mail so unless I'm um, and we are able to get to those doors and they can see the real truth that no matter what the dark money um, Republican nasty Trump policies of hate tell you I have a 15-year record and my 15-year record is in service to people like my mom and dad who were, grew up I grew up very poor, who made it. And now there's me as a state representative. My grandmother immigrated illegally from Canada and settled in Brockton. And I know the value of the American dream because I'm living it just like everyone in this room. So I ask, your, ask for your vote on November 6th and I'm honored to be your state representative. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Okay. I, I have to apologize, but I forgot to mention some great supporters and friends of ours in the city of Brockton. I want to personally thank Archie Gormley and our Brockton firefighters, <laughs> our Brockton Police Department, because I've seen the work they do day in and day out. And also, we're in the VFW, and we have the number one benefits for veterans in the country, but that's because of the veterans here, and thank you to our veterans from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And I would add to that uh, Congressman Stephen Lynch, who's on the Veterans Affairs Committee, who fought to keep our VA here in Brockton, along with the rest of the delegation. So there are two, there are, there's a, a, a couple of campaigns left on the ballot for the county. Okay, after a sticker campaign, John Bradley is the Democratic nominee for Plymouth County, and there'll be one more, so don't leave. We want to get everybody in, and there's a couple more things at the end. John Bradley running for Plymouth County District Attorney. Come on up, John. Thank you, Mark, and thanks to the Brockton City Committee. Well, I certainly fall into the category of people who never thought that he would run for a political office. I'm a career prosecutor with 26 years of experience on the job, and I never had any real interest in politics. But starting in 2016, I became completely disgusted with what I was seeing in Washington. And much closer to home, here in Plymouth County, I'd been dismayed for a long time at the quality of justice being dispensed by the Plymouth County District Attorney's Office. I spent 20 years in that office, and it really saddened me to see the way it's gone downhill over the last several years, and it just hasn't served the people of this county the way it should. Thanks, Jimmy. When people ask me about the state of our criminal justice system, I typically resort to a quote from Winston Churchill on democracy. 
I tell them that it's the worst system in the world, except for all the others. But we can do a lot better. We can improve it. And I have some ideas on how to do that. I want to get rid of our cash bail system because it's unfair, it's discriminatory, and it costs us a lot of money. Pretrial incarceration has become a cottage industry across this country. It costs us about $14 billion a year nationwide. And we're locking people up prior to trial that would never have to do time after a guilty finding. And that simply needs to stop. And when I'm elected district attorney, I will put a stop to this unsavory practice here in Plymouth County. We have to focus on getting the illegally possessed firearms off the streets of our communities. We need to make it harder for people to kill each other. Yet that's never been a focus in the Plymouth County District Attorney's Office. We need to be smarter about how we combat the opioid crisis. The United States has 4.4% of the world's population, yet we consume 30% of the world's opioids. Is it any wonder that we have a problem? Four out of every five heroin addicts start with one pill, folks. We need to involve the medical community more because it's not something we can arrest or incarcerate our way out of. We need to involve doctors, nurses, and medical professionals more so that we can help addicts instead of locking them up. Finally, I believe strongly in transparency. We need a district attorney who meets regularly with people in this community, to listen to people in the community, to address their problems. And you need a district attorney who has integrity and an ethical compass. We in Plymouth County shouldn't be subjected to a district attorney who is currently being sued by our Attorney General because he refuses to comply with a public records request. It begs the question, what has he got to hide? So folks, I spent almost 20 years of my career working here in Brockton. It became like a second home to me, and I miss it. And I believe that with your help, I can get back here working in Brockton, serving the people of this county as your district attorney. Thank you very much. Thank you, John, and it's good to see all the offices uh, have contests. Um, one office that you might forget about every, I think it's six years, is the Plymouth County Clerk of Courts. Robert Creeden sits in that seat, and I understand Brian is going to speak on his behalf. You're going to come up, Brian? Okay. Um, if anybody doesn't know Bob Creeden by now, You've been under a rock someplace for about 40 years because he has the best stories in the world. Hi. Uh, yes, Brother Rob couldn't make it today. And actually, uh, my, uh, my, my brother Mike also sent his regards and also wanted to share his memories of Red Sullivan. Now, Paul Sullivan was a lovely man and a true Democrat's Democrat. For many, many years, for more than 60 years, he worked hard in the Democratic Party. Red was always there for the, for the candidates he supported. You could always count on him to get the people to the polls. Red worked hard to get Democrats elected. He was physically a big man, yet very gentle and always polite. He originally was active in the Ward 6 committee and after redistricting in Ward 5, the committee with me. His mom and dad lived nearby and were all great Democrats. Red chaired the Democratic City Committee for many a number of years when the committee members filed, uh, filled the rooms at the meetings. He attended a number of national conventions and was, was so well regarded in, uh, in Massachusetts that he was chosen to serve on the Electoral College for Jimmy Carter. Jean was by his side always, Red mourned her passing with 
for the rest of his life, and they are missed. And that's the words of my brother Michael, uh, Michael Creedon. And I, I think I was born this way on my birth certificate. It's Michael Creedon, Democrat, uh, uh, retired chief judge of Falmouth District Court and former state representative for Brockton. And thank you. My brother Rob feels the same way, I'm certain. And he's, he's, he's got another election. Unfortunately, nobody ran against him. What are you going to do? <laughs> thank you. I just want to let everybody know, right next to Brockton is Abington, Whitman, and part of East Bridgewater, the part that Michelle doesn't represent. Alex Bazanson was here earlier. He's running for the uh, seat being vacated by Jeff Deal. And he's up against a tough Republican candidate. And if, you, if you're inclined to spend any time helping Michelle, helping the other Democrats cross the line and help Alex Bazanson, because he's a great guy and a good person. So last but not least, I have um, Susan DeCastro to come up. And she, Susan is going to rem do a remembrance of the uh, members of the city committee that passed away and 9-11 victims. She has a prayer to read and uh, then we can go over to the coordinated headquarters and get going on this election. So Susan, come on up. Today we're remembering recently deceased members of the Brockton Democratic City Committee, including without limitation, Paul Sullivan and um, Denise O'Malley. In your hands, O Lord, we humbly entrust our brothers and sisters. In this life, you embraced them with your tender love. Deliver them now from every evil and bid them eternal rest. We also remember all those who died on 9-11-2001. God of the strong and the brave, grant a perfect rest among the souls of the righteous to those who died in service of others because of the 9-11 attacks on the United States. May their dedication in protecting life serve as a shining lamp of love. May all their memories be sanctified with joy and love. May their souls be bound up in the bound of life, a living blessing in our midst. Thank you and amen. In addition, I wanted to let you know that the, there's going to be an annual East Bridgewater Democratic Town Committee breakfast, and it will take place on September 22nd from 10 a.m. until noon at Satcham Rock Community Center, 355 Plymouth Street, East Bridgewater. We've been joined today by some of our East Bridgewater Dems. It would be wonderful if some Brockton Dems would attend this breakfast. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Very nice job and nice thoughts. Um, one of those Dems that's going to be honored is, uh, two of them, is Robert and Roberta McCarthy. Uh, Robert was our Plymouth County Registry of Deeds for, ye for ye I'm Registry of Probate, sorry, for years. And uh, there are others that are going to be honored. So it's nice for us to go over the border and support the other Democrats. I'm going to bring up our chair, Deb Garland, to close out the program. In closing, thank you for attending the 2018 Jean and Paul Sullivan Memorial Breakfast. Be sure to support Democratic candidates when you vote on Tuesday, November 6th, and please join us at the Coordinated Campaign Office on Belmont Street. Thank you.